Great. I think we still have one minute uh, till 10.10, but I can begin to introduce uh, our uh, honored speaker and also the two hosts. Okay, so I will, I will, so I will, I will mute. I will mute myself. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so today's talk will be given by Chong He Wang and from Harvard University, and uh, uh, he is currently a graduate student working with graduate uh, researcher working with Professor George Church at Harvard and professor at Boyden at MIT. So his research interests generally include uh, bioelectronic interfaces, uh, brain science, and synthetic biology. So before he joins Harvard, he works with professor uh, Shen Xu in the University of California, San, San Diego, uh, where he, he did his research on a wearable ultrasonic patch monitoring deep tissue vital signs. So his work has been published in like very top journals, including Nature, Nature Biomedical Engineering, Nature Electronics Science Advances, the Proceeding of National Academy of Science and Advanced Materials, and many other uh, high-impact high journals. So he received a uh, Baxter, Baxter Young Investigator Award for his contribution in developing the world's first variable uh, central blood pressure monitor. Uh, so about our host, like uh, Dr. Su Ming Zhang is actually a postdoc uh, research at UCLA working with Professor Ali. Uh, yeah, how to spell it <laughs> for now? Is Ali Kadem Hosani. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. And he received his uh, PhD degree from University of Montreal. And uh, his research interests are on flexible medical devices and organic bioelectronics. Uh, and organic light emitting diodes. Uh, so his work also published has been published on top journals, including Nature, Advanced Material, Advanced Functional Material, and so many others. So about me, like I just introduced it a little bit on my, on, on, about myself. So anyway, in general, later, like uh, in short, I will uh, be being a postdoc researcher at the Max Planck Institute, working on bio-inspired structures and intelligent structures, and also uh, solid mechanics. So I think I will uh, leave all the rest of the time to Chong He Wang to begin his talk. And uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining us today's, uh, today's talk. So I will unshare my screen and uh, Chong He you can share your screen right now. Perfect. Sure. Yeah. So can everyone see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much know. for uh, Jen and uh, Shi Ming's uh, host introduction. And um, so I would like very happy to introduce some of my research. Uh, so my research topics came along from a basic idea is to transform so wearable electronics from on the skin to below the skin. Uh, so stretchable devices or wearable devices that can naturally conform to human skin allow us to continuous monitoring our health status. So what you are seeing here on this side is a multifunctional patch we fabricated that can be used to measuring the uh, skin electrophysiology such as the ECG and EMG, and also we can measuring the skin temperature all together with the skin strain on the skin. And also we integrated some accelerometer and gyrometer inside the patch and also with some uh, wireless Bluetooth unit. So now we can wirelessly controlling the robotic arm and do the uh, machine interaction. So this device is super powerful and I personally very much like it. Uh, but we, if we see it overall in the wearable electronics field together with industrial prototypes such as the Apple Watch and Fitbit, so we can observe something. Uh, so they are, I mean, they are super powerful. They can measure an array of physical and chemical signals such as the epidermal potential, skin hydration, chemical analysis of the sweat, and skin temperature and many others. So they are hard to remember, but uh, this is not my point. So my point is that those signals have one common limitation, that those signals are all on the skin surface or very, and very shallow tissue close to the skin. So what is really in, uh, happening inside the human body is that, just think about your heart is beating, your gastrointestinal tract, your uh, uh, lungs and stomach, they are continuously contracting, distending every second. But the uh, wearable electronics do not have the access to it because they are lacking of penetrating capability. 
So what we are thinking about, can we design some uh, wearable device that can allow us to monitor in those vital signs in central organs in, in a deep human body that allows us to uh, uh, interrogate those signals um, and what is happening deep inside the human body. So we are thinking about ultrasound. So ultrasound is a very powerful uh, mechanical wave that can not invasively propagate inside a lot of media, such as a solid or liquid media. And in clinical diagnosis, ultrasound can be used to measuring like, uh, like the red picture I illustrated. So we can measure in the cerebral blood supply, central blood pressure, heart activity, gastrointestinal activity, and many others. Uh, however, this uh, ultrasound is basically all terribly limited in hospital because their probe device are very bulky and rigid and their pulse and uh, electronics they are very a very large size and cost a lot of money. So patients can be on, can only be examining in the hospital in a very uh, 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 like monthly or yearly basis. And also this uh, the, the probe itself has to be holded by a well-trained clinician in order to get diagnosis. So we are thinking about and uh, so we are thinking about can we do something about it? So can we do it and make it to some wearable devices? So that's how we initiate our project. So we do a redesign and engineer of the ultrasound, conventional rigid ultrasound probe into a wearable and skin-like format. So here's the outcome, like the red picture. So, so, current, so now the device is only 240 micrometer thickness, which is two orders of magnitude thinner than the conventional ultrasound probe. Mm. And with a similar mechanical modules with a human skin mm. and tissue. It can be naturally conformed to, your, uh, to our skin surface. Uh, so here's our uh, soft approaches to engineering this uh, wearable ultrasonic patch. Uh, so we basically picking the uh, functional material called piezoelectric materials, which is uh, like the small cubes, which can be used to generating and receiving ultrasound waves. And uh, we do a soft material encapsulation of this uh, small uh, functional unit by linking them with a serpentine shaped interconnect, uh, which is used to guarantee the device's stretchability that can allow the device to conform to the human skin at any shape. So here's a uh, material science uh, aspects, and our device is easy to use and can be laminated on the skin naturally, and it can use ultrasound wave to de detect a lot of uh, vital signs underneath the skin. So the first application we are looking at is to use this uh, ultrasonic patch to monitor central blood pressure. And uh, so we are targeting for some uh, central arteries or veins, which are very close to the heart at the neck part. So here is the um, schematics. We laminate our device on, this, on the neck and uh, we launch the ultrasonic wave to monitor in two artery and veins. So one is called corroded artery and another one is called jugular vein. And the, the working principle I illustrated here is to so use a single transducer to launch the ultrasonic wave and the ultrasonic wave can penetrate through the skin and then they reach the uh, uh, blood vessel. And we use the ultrasonic wave to pick up the vessel diameter in real time. And so when the ultrasonic wave meet the anterior wall of the blood vessel, it will get a, a signal reflection and it will be received by the transducer. And there will be a representative anterior wall peak. And when the, uh, when the ultrasonic wave meet the posterior wall of the blood vessel, we will get another reflection peak uh, and as this. So actually during your cardiac cycle, when your heart is beating, your, uh, uh, your vessel is beating as well. So they are simultaneously uh, beating. So we can record this uh, uh, vascular distension and contraction using ultrasound method. So here is how we, uh, our first step. So our second step is to transform this uh, vessel Vessel diameter distension data to blood pressure waveform by some transformation equation. And by using this patch, we can monitor this uh, central uh, uh, artery and veins blood pressure waveform. Uh, for example, we can monitor a carotid artery waveform like this. So we can see clearly the systolic peak and tachycardic notch. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, carotid artery waveform is directly linked to your right, uh, left heart activity. And uh, by observing the right, uh, the internal jugular vein, we can uh, monitor the waveform like this. We can clearly see the ACV peak and x by value to represent it in our cardiac, si uh, cardiac status. And this, uh, bench, uh, this uh, jugular venous waveform representing the uh, activity or of your right heart uh, uh, status. 
So by doing this, we can do a comprehensive diagnosis on, on both left and heart, right heart activities in a long-term and real-time manner. So our devices are not only allow us to monitor in the artery or veins on the neck, we can also do the monitoring of blood pressure on the arms, on the wrist, on the foot. But here's a blood pressure waveform we recorded. And also we did the series of clinical validation against the medical equipment. So here is basically the, uh, the core data. Mm, so in summary, our device holds several promises. So first of all, it has high penetration depth. So instead of scratching the surface of the skin signal, we can now have a penetration capability of four centimeters, which enlarges the sensing range of current wearable electronics. And we are basically pioneering this field by extending a third dimension to the current uh, sensing range of wearable electronics. And second, we can uh, explore a lot of exciting deep tissue signals, such as the central blood pressure and many exciting things are going on. So uh, they are not published yet. And third, it, it, it is a skin-like format, so it, it removes upper dependency. Uh, it, uh, we do not need to a clinician or any person to hold it anymore. It can be naturally conformed to skin and uh, measuring the signal itself. Uh, so the future direction of this techni uh, technology platform uh, of this uh, wearable uh, ultrasonic patch. So in my mind, I was thinking, so first one is that we can increase the penetration, further increase the penetration depth. So the previous work that we published, we can only penetrate like four centimeter. So uh, uh, on pre uh, another work I've, I've done, we have uh, engineered a patch and increased the density of the transducer and also synchronizing working, uh, making them work together. So now we can penetrate around 17 to 18 centimeter underneath the skin. So now we can access to almost any central organ inside the human body, such as the heart, the lungs, and gastrointestinal tract, something like that. And we can also do the, uh, uh, do the uh, organ imaging using ultrasonic patch under this platform. So we can like monitoring these uh, heart activities doing, by doing imaging and also extracting the Doppler signal in the in aorta, something like that. Uh, so I didn't put much data in here because it's unpublished work. Mm, and the second direction I was thinking of is that we can in further increase the energy density that uh, so previous works, and including this uh, first direction, we are using this patch for sensing purposes. But if we in further increase this uh, ultrasound energy, we can make this energy large enough to stimulate the tissue organs, such as uh, doing the uh, central nervous system stimulation, doing the brain circuitry regulation, and also other uh, neural circuits, such as the uh, vagus nerve or peripheral nerve. So we can non-invasively and doing the deep tissue regulation of this uh, uh, nervous or other organ system. So that's basically uh, a future direction, a future work in my mind. So our work is basically drawing a lot of uh, attention. So after the work is published, the automatic store reaches 320, which is uh, pretty good. And also it is being excluded, highlighted by uh, hundreds of famous media. And some of the example like uh, National Geographic magazine and force uh, MIT Technology Review. And uh, luckily we also got the uh, exclusive, hi exclusively highlight from uh, uh, NIH director, Dr. Francis Collins. So he wrote a blog on our uh, patch. So what is making me feel most excited about is that our technology has a, uh, a spin-off company, which is run by my advisor, Professor Xu. So, so which is um, when the nature all looks uh, uh, spin-off prices. So I'm not personally involved in the funding uh, development process, but uh, I'm very happy to see uh, our technology has uh, uh, will have come out to a product uh, in the future. Uh, so uh, so here is uh, basically all my talk, and I would like acknowledge that. So those work are per, um, not definitely not in my personal work, and uh, and I give a lot of appreciation to my advisor, Professor Xu, and also my hemodynamics outstanding uh, colleagues listed here. And uh, uh, so I basically in this talk, I didn't make too much technical depth introduction. So all, all very in, in superficial, uh, superficial stuff. And thank you very much for your attention and uh, welcome to, uh, so I'm very happy to take any questions. Yeah, thanks. Thanks Choco for your presentation. And it's very interesting like technique, uh, technology, and uh, so if anyone has any questions and uh, want to discuss with uh, Chong He and please, uh, please go ahead and 
But first, unmute yourself and please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. All right. Can I can I take the first round question? Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, hi, Chongke. Very very impressive work by you. Actually, we you know in our group uh, group journal club we discussed your work before. So actually, I have some questions remained during last journal club. So here, I hope you can answer answer this question in your in your expertise. Sure, sure. So. Uh, now I have four questions. The first question is, how about your device power consumption? Cost oh yeah. So currently this device is, uh, we engineer in the front end patches. Uh, so, uh, but we did a series of measurements. So uh, the, the patch is con uh, power consumption is about uh, 29.3 milliwatts. Uh, so it, uh, it's not that, not that huge, uh, but still we need the, needed to be connected to some post-end electronics. But uh, actually in our group, we are actively working on to integrating all kinds of post-end electronics into a, a flexible printed circuit board to make it, make the device fully wearable. And this work has not been published yet, but uh, this technical platform is uh, definitely can be assembled, uh, resembled or uh, assembled to a, uh, a post-end system and to make, make them uh, autonomous and wearable uh, platform. Oh, okay, so 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 you mean the power consumption is is not so big, right? Yeah, yeah. And how about the heating heating issues? Like oh. for long term for long term usage, I I guess every electronics, including the uh, conventional electronics, will be heat heat. Great right? question. And so, also yeah, and also yeah, uh, yeah. sorry, yeah. and also if the if there's any heating, how how about the the bonding between each layers? I guess the heating will, will induce the, the delamination of the, mm. of the layer by layer uh, structure. Yeah, yeah, my, this... yeah, yeah, great question. Okay, yeah. so actually the device is ultrasonic based devices and it's uh, powered by this pulse generation. So that means uh, we usually uh, pulse the device in, with, uh, in the infrequent manner. So like, uh, there is a concept called PRF and it's called pulse repetitive frequency. So we usually use 500 kilohertz, so which is a uh, mm, uh, uh, 500 hertz. So that means in, in, in each second we pulse the device for 500 times, and uh, each each pulse is a very short uh, periods of uh, small pulses. So mm -hmm. the so most of the time, uh, so like 99 percent of the time, the device in the red is in is in red state. So the power consumption is, is not so high and mm -hmm. it will not induce any uh, heat. Actually, we did a lot of testing in this, in this, in this devices and then we didn't find any significant heating of the, uh, to the substrate or to the bonding side of the, of the wires and the transducers. Okay, okay, thank you. So can I ask the next question? Sure, so, sure. Uh, yeah, so, cause I'm very curious about your technology. So I list some, so the sure, second, the second question is, I think every everyone here do some ultrasound test in the in the, in the hospital, right? Yeah. So yeah. when we when we use the regular probe, we we usually just uh, put a thin layer of coupling or the hydrogel on the top of the skin on the, on, yeah. and also on the surface of the probe to to decrease the signal uh, to increase the signal to noise ratio to decrease yeah. the interface impedance, right? Exactly. So how, how about yours? Cause you, you don't you don't mention any couple. Of yeah 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 yeah. I didn't mention that, but uh, this is really a new unique feature of our devices that we yeah. do not yeah. need any coping gel. Wow. Because our device is so soft that it can be conformed our skin with a uh, with zero gap. So the main purpose of applying gel is to remove all the air gap between the interface uh, between the substrate and the skin. So usually there will be a um, like micro bubbles in, inside the surface and causing a lot of signal reflection and bounce back to the probe. So it, it will cause a lot of uh, signal resonating in the probe and the imaging will be greatly blurred. But actually our device can fully eliminate those air gaps and they can be naturally conformed to the skin by vulnerable interaction. Okay, okay, yeah. cool, cool. That's, that's, that, yeah, that's very interesting actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the, the third question is, I noticed 
I noticed in your in your slides that you you just put your device your pet device on, uh -huh. on a lot of parts of your 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 human bodies, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I noticed that all all of the all of the surface are flat. Right? Oh, so, you mean the surface are flat? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean did you do any test on the on the unflat like the curvature one? Yeah, of course. Uh, so actually, those 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 surfaces are seems flat, but not flat, uh, not actually totally flat. So yeah, since the this device is a single bit single transistor based activation, so as long as there is a some target or artery beneath each one of the transducer, and uh, so we if you can detect the signal, then any any kind of a compact surface should be fine. You already tested. Uh, cause, uh, I, I, in, during master degree, I, I take a course, and uh, the, in, in this course, there's technology in, uh, attract me. It's called high frequency, uh, uh, high frequency intensive uh, focused uh, ultrasound. It's uh, all termed by high food. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm wondering if your if your device is curvature. It's like curvature. Will will be any. Oh, interference between between each between each uh, ultrasound probe, and I guess then if if the if the focus if I mean if the is if, if the focus is just like a laser point, then mm. the heating will be a problem. So some people use this technology to to kill the tumor. So I'm wondering what's what's the uh, what's the problem if the if the detector curvature is is not so flat? Did you? Yeah. Have any perspective? Yeah, I think on you raised two questions. So first question is, will the curvature will introduce any uh, frequency shift or any yeah. any yeah. impedance shift to the devices? Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we already demonstrated uh, in our paper and showing under any kind of curvature or, stre or stretch, there's the impedance of each transducer will not shift. And uh, I think your second question should be, if this uh, curvature of the skin or any tissue tissue contacts will create any focusing and then introduce heating in tissue. So yeah. in this project, we use high frequency transducer. It's around 7.5 megahertz. And uh, it's uh, energy density is very low. Mm -hmm. uh, so the so the acoustic pressure is, is very, uh, much lower beyond the FDA proof level. So we are uh, confident that even if all the transducers are activated and they are even focusing into the same spot, it will not introduce any heat. And we also tested in, 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 in hydro, using hydrophone system in, in water. And we, we confirmed that. And we also discussed it in, in a paper. So sorry, I didn't put those information in, in, in this talk. I thought it should, should not be so much technical depth. Yeah, 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 yeah that's <laughs> fine, that's fine. Yeah, I think you already, you already make, your, make your answer very clear. And uh, mm -hmm. one more question, last question. Sure, sure, sure. No yeah, I, cost, I noticed that uh, your, your work has been covered by nature. Nature BME or Nature Electronics, uh, and I, and I, yeah, I noticed the the your, your your in your cover image in your cover figure the device oh, yeah. is is adhered on, on the on the on the joint. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I I don't know why you put put on, on the joint because you didn't oh. you didn't do any test on the on the on the joint. And yeah. I, I I know I know. Maybe on the attached on the joint will make your work in, very impressive. That's the that's the media function, right? But yeah, I, yeah, I don't, yeah. But I don't know whether you you really do that do this kind of test on your on your joint. Yeah, yeah, it? yeah. That's a that's a great comment. Uh, so so that's a so we put it on the joint to make make to demonstrate our mechanical conformality. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we actually didn't do any testing. So yeah. we uh, so so in our words, if we wanna. Mm, publish like cover, so, so you need a very impressive image. And yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe it's a journal profile or something like that. So yeah. that's our strategy. So but uh, we didn't do any testing, but uh, there's certainly some ideas that we can uh, put the uh, conformal ultrasound patch on the on the on the finger joint because ultrasound can do the imaging. So we can image in the like the finger joint to to monitoring the, like the uh, arthritis. So mm -hmm. it's like a disease in in, in joint. So we we actually have a grant on this. So we, we have this idea in mind, and uh, finally when we do the image demonstration, we put the device on the on the, on a joint to 
make it more it seems more beautiful. <laughs> but, 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 but but, I mean the John part the, the John part is full of full of bone. Is yeah. There yeah. Any, any interference is, is there any like further interference? From the of course, of course, yeah, bone will introduce a very strong reflection. But uh, actually, we yeah. can uh, detect those minute reflection features, and we can uh, profile in this uh, finger joint using ultrasound. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for your thank you for your question. Uh, thank you for yeah, your no. answer. <laughs> yeah, no yeah, Thank you as well. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, Thanks, Bing Bing, for the for the questions. And uh, so, actually, Chongko, I also have some questions on the signal sure. processing. Um, okay. It's not uh, because I'm out of field and I'm not familiar with all the electronics. But uh, recently, I watched a movie called Green Hunt, and they are like mm -hmm. use like in, they are just using sonar like uh, to detecting submarines. And uh, but it will come in a lot of noises, so you have to uh, have a qualified people to actually you know. Uh, to identify what is actually a submarine or if it's actually yeah. something else. So I'm just wondering, like, because I think your mechanism uh, kind of similar to sonar, right? Like, yeah. uh, so I'm just wondering, how do you like remove the noises and detecting the like the exact information as you want it? Like, yeah. Yeah. Good question. It's very happy to answer. So, so basically, we do not remove any noise because that that's a kind of. Uh, uh, manipulation of the signal. So we actually tune the device to make the signal to noise ratio higher so that we can easily recognize you know, any of the significant peak of values that, that can be useful for our research purposes. So there are a lot of ways that can, can, can okay. increase the quality such as uh, 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 tuning the volt activation voltage and uh, building better pulse and electronics and also using better filters. So it's something like that. There are a lot of uh, over some more uh, or hardware to do it. Okay, so is that like uh, instead of using some algorithm to re uh, re suppress the uh, noises, you just like uh, uh, tune the device itself to uh, to target specifically for the, for example, central artery uh, pressure and. Uh, okay, I see. That's a really okay. smart move. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. So, so if any. Anyone else has questions? Please uh, unmute yourself and uh, uh, to discuss and discuss. Yeah, yeah. we don't have to limit the, the the question to the research itself. And also, other thing like if you have a question for Jen or Shimin or so we are both all in graduate school. So uh, any question regarding the graduate school application or career uh, in academia, so something like that, all welcome. I think uh, Bing has a question, right, Jen? Bing? You see, yeah, he sent you the, oh, okay. the message. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He sent you a message. So, yeah, so he sent me a message. And uh, so, yeah, uh, Bing uh, asked that, like, uh, uh, could you comment on the technical challenge of increasing the uh, penetration gaps, for example, for future organ Im imaging, such as that? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get the uh, So, so she wants to comment like on the technical challenge uh, yeah, yeah. of increasing the penetrating, penetrating the depths, for example, mm -hmm. for future organ images. Uh, uh, such as that. Yeah. uh, actually we have already done that, but uh, we didn't, the, the paper isn't published yet. So we have already demonstrated doing the cardiac imaging and the organ imaging using this uh, wearable patches. So, <laughs> so I didn't put much data here. Uh, so there's certainly a lot of challenges because this uh, the human body shape is uh, a curvy linear, and uh, so if we do the imaging, we need to require all the transducers to synchronizing working together. And uh, each transducer has a phase shift due due to the conform to this uh, non uh, non uh, non cylindrical surfaces. And uh, we have to calibrate the the, the patch using algorithms or we, we have to design a system that can tolerate. So this is the major the, the most critical question. Uh, technical challenges. So other challenges remain to how to integrate all kinds of uh, uh, signal processing and transmitting unit into the patch because if we do the imaging then the pulse and electronics will be very uh, power consumption uh, power consuming and also 
algorithm is uh, the real time algorithm process unit is is, is different from the from this work I, I discussed here. So they, they are they are on a different level of engineering. Uh, but uh, this this does, does not mm, mean that that is technically not solvable. So there are a lot of uh, commercial products that can already do the ultrasound imaging in a wireless and affordable format. So as long as we move moving along this direction, those uh, technical challenges will one day be solved. Okay, yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, as a host, I think I also need to ask uh, some questions. So, First of all, thank you very much, Chonghu. I think we met uh, two years ago, right? So I'm yeah, 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 yeah. Just okay, right, yeah. right after you published your great work. So, I mean, congratulations again, you know, on your great uh, success. Thank you. So uh, personally, you know, as a, you know, so-called, you know, expert in this field also, so I, uh, Jen invited me, so, but I don't think I'm an expert, so, you know, <laughs> I'm still learning, you know, it's kind of a faster rising uh, area. But the, the area of the variable sensors are, are extremely important. It may be not a technology for today, but it is the technology for tomorrow. So, and uh, there's a lot of uh, bell sensors, variable bell sensors, for example, mm -hmm. uh, measuring sweat or something others are currently, you know, ongoing. You know, uh, Professor Gao in Caltech and uh, and yeah, some yeah. of the you know, they are leading that direction also. I know. But you know, it may take some time for them to go to the market because, you know, for the customers, for our individuals, uh, this kind of technology is kind of for tomorrow, you know, is not widely accepted yet. Yeah, yeah. But when every time you go to a clinic, you know, the first thing, you know, the doctor will do three things, right? First is body weight and, mm -hmm. you know, your, your, your body lines. And then the other thing is blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So that's really a very important indicator for the for the health, you know, for yeah, everyone. Yeah. So from from the kid to the to the adults, so all these things. And uh, you know, I think the the technology now is that it's a very promising direction, and you know, I think it can. This is the reason why how a startup already, right? So you know, it's very promising. So uh, I read the paper. So seems you know the blood pressure is different. So you know, in the hospital now, people measure is a uh, peripheral blood pressure. That means we use a cuff, and then you squeeze the blood vessel, and then you measure you have two uh, systolic, systolic pressure and uh, diastolic pressure. Mm. We got measured. Yeah. But I'm wondering if there's some uh, correlation between this uh, peripheral blood pressure and the central blood pressure. Mm. And it seems that technology is very promising for measuring the central uh, blood pressure but are there some other technologies that are available to detect uh, the, the uh, central blood pressure and what is the pros and cons in that yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, perspective? Yeah, yeah, yeah. very good yeah. question. So very professional question. Uh, so actually I prepared several slides, but I didn't put it here. So I thought that was too technical detail. Uh, but, uh, but the central blood pressure and, and the peripheral blood pressure, there are certainly a lot of discrimin uh, and there are a lot, a lot of difference. So, Central blood pressure means measuring a blood pressure at the carotid artery side or a aorta side. So this is very close to the heart. And those artery has a very complex and a much more complex than the peripheral artery. And those artery has a, very, uh, has a much larger diameter than the peripheral artery. That means this a peripheral, your peripheral artery is pretty small and rigid and um, central artery is very complex and soft. So it will create a lot of difference in the blood pressure value in either in either the blood pressure waveform or the, like the absolute value like the systolic pressure. So the reason that why hospital check the peripheral blood pressure is because they have they only have one non-invasive way that using cuff to do it. Uh, otherwise, they, they have not no way to do it non-invasive. Uh, so if we want to measure in the central blood pressure non-invasive, there is no way. So we, you cannot put a cuff in, in the neck because it will cause Cause you cause person to unbreathe, so that that's not not practical, right? So ultrasound method can certainly do the same thing, measuring the carotid artery diameter, but it also required to be performed in hospital. So so talking about 
non-invasive uh, uh, non uh, non method, there are certainly some invasive methods can do it. So we can implant some catheter inside a peripheral artery, a peripheral artery or in the central artery. But those methods are too invasive and causing a lot of bleeding and also inflammation, which is definitely not suitable for long-term monitoring purposes uh, in, in, in this manner. So we, we, we focus this challenge and design this patch and so that we can use ultrasound to non-invasively interrogate the central blood pressure and, um, and, and in a long-term manner. And also, since this difference in the uh, central blood pressure and the peripheral blood pressure, central blood pressure is much more important than the peripheral blood pressure. The, uh, so in, in current field, although everybody measuring per, per, peripheral blood pressure, they just, so they just don't uh, uh, want to acknowledge that the peripheral blood pressure is not accurate to represent this uh, uh, vascular, uh, a cardiovascular activity. So what is really important is the central blood pressure. So that's basically a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of journals have discussed it. And uh, so, so that's very easy to understand because those arteries are very close to your heart. So this hemodynamics is very similar to what is hap really, really happening inside your heart. So, so that's why we're focusing on these uh, central challenges instead of focusing this uh, peripheral blood pressure because uh, there's certainly a lot of prototypes in academia and in industry have demonstrated this, this concept. However, the, most, of the, most of the wearable sensor, I don't see they, they can measure in the absolute pressure in, the, in, in, in either peripheral or central. Yeah, so that's basically our contribution. And uh, so I hope this answers may help. Yeah, yeah, great. Very good answer. Yeah. Actually, I'm also impressed by your great English. Yeah, it's, oh, yeah, it's yeah, kind yeah. of uh, uh, enjoying uh, your, your answer. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. So the other thing that is that, you know, uh, how long do you think it will take to set a standard for this technology, for example, to be uh, you know, used for a larger uh, you know, amount of population? For example, you may have a different uh, to, as, as just you discussed, to, to put it on the neck or put on the other part of the human body and then you get a different values. And which part will be the, 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 the best set to be used? So you set your standard. The other one is that the human to human difference, right? For example, mm -hmm. I use it and then you, you use it. Maybe there's a little bit of difference. So mm -hmm. how, you know, how you think that you are going to set this standard and this also will promote this technology to be commercialized in the future? Yeah, 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 yeah. good question. So uh, I think if we if we truly want to know what's happening inside the heart, we, we have to put the put the cup on the neck and take the take the measurement. And if we just want to conform or uh, 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 conform to the like clinical standard and what what is doctor is actually using, we just put it on on the arm or doing the brachial pressure uh, sensing. So there's no no much. Uh, uh, strong requirement for that. So it depends on what application we're targeting. And uh, so, and also if we are um, targeting for especially some applications such as peripheral uh, vascular diseases, uh, so we can also detect the uh, peripheral blood pressure and, and anywhere as long as there is a vessel beneath. So that's basically my answer for the first question. And second for the person to person variation. So we, 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 actually did a lot of testing on our, ourselves and also did to some patient. And we observe a lot of uh, minute difference between person to person. And we think those information are very uh, informative and have a lot of value inside to indicating personal cardiovascular system health status. And also it can be correlating to uh, many other like vascular rigidity uh, and uh, 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 impedance. So we can, we can, we can use them to Mm, to indicate a lot of uh, other physiology, physiology of each person. And we think that they are very useful. So, and we are also implementing larger number of clinical trials uh, within UC San Diego and also collaborating with other hospitals. But uh, it isn't finished yet. Mm. So for sure, it will, it, it will get a lot of uh, uh, individual difference. And I think those differences are meaningful. And those, those data, if we combine them with some artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithm to analyze this, per, this person's health status, I think those are, uh, has a very great potential in, in personalized medicine and healthcare. 
Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing this uh, information also. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, hi Chongho. Yeah. I yeah. Actually, yeah, because I, I noticed like all your work was uh, uh, was done in your master's and you published yeah, yeah. Uh, nature, uh, medical engineering, nature in your master's and that's even difficult for some like PhD students. So, and, and I, I am also like very slow on doing projects. So it, it usually takes me years to do one project. So I'm just wondering like, what's your like secrets or what's your, you know, you know, you know maybe you can share some experience with us on how you can make such a great job okay. uh, in, okay. yeah. in such this a short time. Yeah. This question make him relax. Yeah. Jen is so humble. So, so. <laughs> Uh, so honestly, I very much respect Jen and Shimin's work. They are all published in, in Nature and Science, and which is a journal I got rejected there also. And uh, so I, I feel very frustrated. Uh, uh, so I think, um, first of all, is luck. So when we get, when we get a very good advisor and he will inspire you and uh, give you all the uh, all inspiration and also a lot of ideas. And he will, he will Together with with those, you will also give a lot of credits. So which which made me made me frustrated every day as well. And uh, so during basically, uh, I can share some of my um, life in master. So we actually a very busy lab in, in, in UCSD. And the Professor Xu is very, he is a very extremely hardworking person. So he basically works every day and 365 days a year. And he always push us to do this aim and uh, make us thinking, what can we do to make it better? And when we do some uh, small small result, he will always make us think, mm, so how, how is it compared to everybody who is in this field? Can you beat them? So can you can you make yourself the best material? So he always makes us think like this. So we have to, so that's that's how it make us to moving forward and uh, working every day and think about. Uh, scratching our heads, seeing how how can we make a difference, and uh, so it, I think this is a very good education for some uh, new person in, in the lab. And uh, so, uh, so the first year I joined I joined the lab, I feel very uncomfortable, and uh, uh, since uh, I'm not very mm, strong in, in critical thinking and uh, I'm not, not very good at designing research. But uh, after he, he did a lot of uh, input in, in, in my research, so I was gradually know how to build my own research and uh, and designing different research harder than existing research, existing experimental research in other papers. I think that's a, that's a very important steps uh, and or uh, a method in, in publishing very good journals. Uh, and second, I think I think this is most basic probably the most important one that uh, we have to work very hard. So uh, we had uh, we have group meeting every every Monday. <laughs> so so that's uh, so that's how we, we are very productive. And um, uh, so I think the. Um, I think the third thing is that we have to read a lot of papers. So, uh, so basically, uh, my advisor he always check our uh, collection of literature. So he 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 taught us to use the like software like Handle or Medley, so to collect the reference of the of each paper. So he he, he always told us to to read read a lot of paper and became the master of literature. So. Mm, so that's that's how we can generate some research idea like this. So basically, we read around one thousand uh, papers and collect them in, in in categories in one year. So so I think this is a very good uh, a very good strategy for graduate students. So accumulating one thousand paper in your and those categories uh, per year. So after five years, six year PhD, you have read uh, read or categorized. 6,000 papers. So you, you basically know everything about the field. So nobody can beat you. So that, that's a very, I think that's a very good strategy for um, pushing yourselves work to very outstanding journals. Um, uh, let me think. Well, I think that's a most, 
Well, I think uh, those ideas and uh, advices are coming from one source. That's from uh, my, my advisor's advisor, from uh, Professor John Rogers in Northwestern. So he is uh, also a very a crit crit critical guy. And uh, so he, he has a lot of uh, good ideas and thoughts. So he asked the students to work very hard. And uh, so basically, so I remember one sentence from uh, Professor Rogers and I very much respect it. He said, uh, if you want to be a good graduate student, so if you can work 12 hours a day, so work, work 13 hours. So mostly your most productive outcome coming from the last, 12, uh, last two hours. <laughs> and uh, and so that motivates me to work uh, to to work on those uh, research continuously, and uh, and also I think one important thing is that you have, uh, we have to learn to build strong collaboration with uh, competitive people. So so in each lab we have a lot of peers, and uh, each peers have different expertise. So personally, I'm not very strong at signal processing and doing the circuit board the designing. So I ask a lot of help from my colleagues, which I say in a lot of acknowledgement. So they help me to design the circuit boards and doing the signal processing, which help me solve, solve a lot of challenges. So, and I personally also help them to, to think, think about their project. And uh, so we, we, we let each other co-author the paper and uh, we share our productivity. So I think uh, finding finding good collaborations and building strong connection with your peers is also very important in pushing this project forward because not everyone is is uh, omni omni talented. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's basically my, my ideas for the for being yeah, very yeah. yeah. Thanks so much. I I think like I I can actually learn a lot from you like on these aspects because. Um, because indeed, like uh, collecting literatures and collaborations are very important, but I'm kind of weak on that. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, I think like uh, probably for me, like in the future, I need to read more literatures and to be more active on finding collaborations with people. And, you know, yeah, I think that's my, my problem on doing projects because you can see like all my papers are two or three authors. So yeah, so I have to do all the job. And uh, so the timeline has become very long. Yeah, but I, I think your advice is really important for me as well. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and also I, I get like a question on the chat section. And uh, so, yeah, it's from, uh, from uh, yeah. So yes, uh, so uh, she has a questions uh, like um, uh, do, because you, you mentioned that you did some you want to do uh, you you actually doing some brain stimulations neural stimulations with your yeah, yeah. technique technology. Uh, and she wants you to know that do the participants need to shave their hair for receiving the ultrasound uh, brain stimulations? And also, it's just another question on neuron science experiments, like uh, yeah, yeah. The, the timing of brain stimulation and the brain signal recording is vital. So do you have an idea about the delay in signal processing? And uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very good question, Jen. Yeah, so shaving the hair, I think that's, uh, uh, we had to shave the hair. But, uh, but you see, uh, in, in a field of uh, neural stimulation or neural recording, so I personally stay in, in, in Charles Lieber's lab for, for half a year to doing a lot of implantable neural electronics that can, uh, that can do the invasive uh, recording or stimulation of the neurons. So, so, so invasive implantable probe also requires to remove the hair. Otherwise, we cannot do the craniotomy of the, uh, and to implant the probes. Mm. So I think uh, compared to the neural diseases, shaving the hair is a mi minor is a minor issue. Otherwise, this uh, person is uh, has suffered from like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson disease. So I think shaving the hair is uh, is not not uh, <laughs> it, will, uh, it will introduce some pain in appearance, but uh, it will cure it will cure the pain. Uh, so. So that, that's basically my, my first answer. And the uh, uh, second one is, so you mean, you mean a delay or something? Uh, I mean, there certainly may be some delay in, in, the, in the neural response because, uh, uh, so if we want to do some, uh, it depends, it really depends on what application we are talking about. We want to do some like uh, neural regeneration, like using the brain stimulation for regenerating neurons. 
So it certainly had a lot of delay. It will take weeks or months to get the neurons, the newborn neurons migrate to some certain area or a, a local neuron regeneration. So it takes several weeks. Uh, but uh, instead of uh, instant uh, stimul stimulation, uh, like the, doing some ablation of some neurons, I think that's the instantaneous. Uh, uh, that's instantaneous and uh, will uh, get affected immediately. Uh, such as using the ultrasound to ablate, to focus the energy to ablate some neurons to remove those uh, dead neurons, neuron cell bodies. So that's basically instantaneous. So, so the response time and our delay depends on application. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you for the, for the, for, for the answers. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I believe you, you answered the questions very clearly and uh, uh, also, how is your life at in Harvard? Like, uh, because uh, right after you go to Harvard, when you Harvard, the pandemic happens. So, so is uh, it all right? everything, everything. Uh, I think it's a, uh, it's a uh, bittersweet. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So sometimes I also uh, I didn't expect a lot of things to happen. So after I joined Harvard, I I joined the uh, Professor Charles Lieber's lab and uh, working in the implantable neuron electronics for a while. Uh, but suddenly, so, so there's something happened. So Professor Lieber uh, is a, is a, is a, cannot uh, stay in Harvard, so I had to force to change another lab. Uh, so I mean, uh, I think Professor Lieber is very nice, nice to me, and he gave me a lot of inspiration as well. And uh, uh, he is a very focused research scholar, and I feel very painful for, for his lead. Uh, uh, but uh, I think this uh, force leaving and me to try another lab, I think gave me some new opportunity as well. So I have a chance to really select my research focus. So I choose to join some lab that's it, that is more focusing on biology. Uh, so, so, so I have this idea, not, not, not totally because of me. So be, before I leave UCSD, so my advisor, Professor Shiri, he, uh, he instructed me very, um, to, he told me that uh, most of the guy in this uh, soft electronics, they are material science guy. And uh, they, they only know about how to fabricate these devices. And they, they know very few about biology. So focus yourself on biology and medicine. So that's, that's my major motivation of choosing like biology lab in medical school. And uh, so what I'm planning to do in the future is to using some uh, synthetic biology method that can be, uh, that is normally using protein engineering or DNA or RNA engineering uh, uh, processes. So we use that method to uh, mapping this uh, neural circuits in the brain or doing any uh, therapies in the, in the nervous system. So that, that's my uh, future direction. And uh, I feel very excited about learning new stuff. And so that's, that's my encouragement to our uh, 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 material science engineering society uh, people, I, I wish everybody could learn multiple fields because, uh, mm, so I think finding, if, if somebody wants to find some academia position, especially in very good, very high tier universities, so you, you truly have to know a lot of fields. So like two to three fields, I think that's a basically a requirement because, uh, so it's, uh, so the university, I think they rank their applicants by their knowledge and also their mm, uniqueness of, and their, uh, how their pioneering capability they have in, in, in the future and what's their potential. So if you can learn several fields and, uh, and uh, in the future you can find a unique spot, you can combine them together. So you can make yourself very unique and uh, if, if this is a very promising or have a lot of value, you can certainly find some very good position. And that's how I observe from a uh, lot of, uh, of a resting star in, in, in Harvard, MIT, and Stanford. Uh, so I think that's uh, basically mm, what I was thinking. And, uh, and that's how Harvard inspires me. And, uh, and, uh, and yeah, yeah. I think this uh, this is a bittersweet process, and uh, so after this pandemic, I was forced to stay stay in, 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 at home and uh, not doing actual experiment. Although I'm a pure experimentalist, so I think that's a that's a pretty uh, pretty much what what I what I, what I undergo in recent period. But uh, I think this is a really 
had a great experience. Yeah, how about yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, when the pandemic comes, like uh, I was also kind of depressed because I used to have some offers in US and it's all frozen. So <laughs> yeah, but. But I think we will both do good, do 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 pretty well in the in the future. So don't worry about that. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I think I totally agree with you that we need to have a two or three fields to like uh, probably not master in all those fields, but at least get some experience on two or three fields. It's very important. So it, I mean, I do the same same strategy. Like uh, in my in my PhD, I do fabrications and soil mechanics. And in the future, I will be doing some robotics. I think uh, that's because a lot of robo mm -hmm. robots requires like kind of like a very intricate design on the on structures, and that's kind of my, my expertise. But I, I can also learn control theory and other uh, tech technologies from robotics. Yeah, I think yeah, that's very good point. Or what do you say? But anyway, we are all doing pretty great, even though yeah, some like you know you know, up and downs, but eventually it is up. Just like stock market, it will eventually go up, even though there are some fluctuations. So, and I, I, I received a question from a comment section that, uh, uh, so anyway, like this is from, uh, from Xiaoyong, and uh, he said, like, hello, Chonghe, it is very impressive research, and uh, do you think it is reasonable to integrate other functions in one device? such as ECG, blood pressure, temperature, and blood oxygen? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a great question. So we can certainly integrate all kinds of modality into a same system, as long as we can identify some uh, very critical clinical problems. So then it will uh, uh, came an out outcome to be a very cool project. So why I'm kind of immediately thinking about to correlate ECG and blood pressure together, because we can measuring the pulse transition time called PTT. Uh, so, so that's a very unique feature to indicating our uh, vascular rigidity. So what is PTT is that the transporting time from your heart, uh, from your, uh, when the pulse is from your heart to any part of, the, of your artery. So, so this uh, blood pressure actually is a mechanical pulse. So it will take time to transport, right? And uh, so if we can measure this, uh, Measuring this time, we can know this uh, how, how fast this uh, mechanical wave is transporting. If your vascular, if your vasculature is very rigid, it will transport very fast. So if it's very complex, it will transport in, uh, slower a little bit. So how do we measure it? So we basically measure the ECG and also measuring the blood pressure. So ECG signal will transport uh, will get instantaneously when your heart, uh, when your heart muscle, your cardiac myocyte is beating. So it, it will take zero seconds or zero milliseconds. But the, the pulse actually take like 100 milliseconds uh, propagating from your heart to, to a peripheral vessel, such as your uh, uh, on your wrist and also on the foot. So if we can measure in the, the, the propagation time of this, and then using the total distance to divide this uh, transition time, we can know the velocity. And using this velocity, we indicate this uh, vascular rigidity to evaluate the overall vascular uh, uh, stiffness. So I can uh, certainly introduce a, a lot of, uh, or indicating a lot of uh, health status of a person. So we actually, uh, we actually can test it on, uh, on like older people or, or infants. So we can, we can certainly tell a lot of difference. Yeah, so that's my major, that's my answer. So if we call it temperature, I didn't think, I'm, I'm not think, uh, I haven't think of any uh, very interesting uh, direction that can, or problems that need to s combine those two two modalities. So if you, if you, if you have those ideas, you can you can, you can talk to me now, or you can email me. So I definitely love to brainstorm. And uh, blood oxygen, I mean, uh, so I I didn't see not very quite much paper talking about creating oxygen and blood pressure together to indicate any. Uh, any diseases or or problems, uh, but certainly this is a good way to think of. So we can do some uh, comprehensive uh, analysis of your blood, such as blood pressure, blood oxygen. But uh, normally, if we do not have any long diseases such as COVID or the, uh, others, your, your oxygen level is very stable. It's remaining around ninety five percent percent or ninety eight percent. So it, it never drops down very easily. 
Yeah, thanks for the question. And uh, we just received uh, a few more questions. And uh, the first one is from Momo. And uh, uh, she said like, uh, hi, Chonghe, would you like to share how to draw attractive picture to show your research? Because I can see the pictures in your pages are so beautiful and attractive. So I just want to interrupt here a little bit because I did my first talk on how to make academic figures. If you are interested, you can have a look. So, and now it's the time for Chong to answer your questions. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't uh, so, the writer's months. <laughs> yeah, I saw Jen's paper and uh, Jen's talk on, on his size. I think that's a very, very beautiful, very beautiful artwork. And uh, so Jen is definitely an artist and probably better than me. So I would like to share my humble experience. So, so there are a lot of certainly a lot of software available and, and it's uh, free for students, such as 3ds Max. And all, uh, so this is used for 3D measure modeling. Uh, so the, the advantage of 3D Max is because it is, uh, there are a lot of models that are open. So we can directly download the, the model and integrate it into your you know, databases and then you can do the uh, rendering or uh, and combining different features inside your own uh, picture. Yeah, uh, so 3D Max is a, is a mo very powerful tool for 3D modeling. And if we want to get some uh, 2D dimensional images, so like hand sketches, so, so you can use Adobe Illustrator. So that one is very powerful. So you can you can draw a lot of things on, on computer. So basically, I, I got a small pad. So, so I recommend you can get a small drawing pad and uh, you can download some image. So you, you, you think that's good. And then you can copy this image on, those, on, those, on, on your pad. And uh, so fill in the color and tuning the shading or shining spot. So that, that is very powerful as well. And uh, I, think, I think gradually this uh, journal preference is shifting from 3D image to some 2D, 2D dimensional sketches. I think that's a major trend like the, a lot of uh, High profile journal like the Nature Review Materials, like Jen have published. Also, I think those have a lot of good examples on how to join these uh, hand sketches. So you can, uh, you can, so my personal advice is you can download a lot of uh, 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 images from uh, like Nature Review Materials, a science perspective. Uh, so you can, you, you can learn how they are painting their, 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 their ideas and what, what the style they preference. And most importantly, how to learn that, how to learn those software. So you can, so YouTube is a very powerful channel so that you can, and very good sources for you to learn those skills. So they have a lot of uh, master skill, master levels uh, experts on, on YouTube. They, so if you wanted to know some uh, special expertise, you can just type anything that you want to achieve in, in YouTube. Such as if you want to do a 3D rendering, you just type 3D rendering, 3D as maxing in YouTube, and you can find a lot of, uh, useful video in, 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 in YouTube and it only takes three to four minutes to learn and know, now you know how to do it. So that's basically uh, my advice in, in, in drawing. And I think most important thing is not software usage uh, or how to use the software. So software is basically a basic thing. So what is most important is how is your idea and how to demonstrate your idea. So this is, uh, so designing is the most important thing if you, if you want to get a best image. So how to, how to gain this uh, design to like, you have to read a lot of uh, literatures. So you gain some ideas and, and talents and also some uh, inspiration, especially inspiration from those uh, high profile journals. So I usually made a collection of uh, those high profile journals image. And uh, so you, you can say, compile them up and then scan through one, each one of this. And then, and then you get a general idea of how to generate a good image. And uh, how to formalize this kind of, kind of uh, thinking is that, so you have to identify what's the spot and make a certain image look great. So such as the uh, combination of color or the uh, uh, profile of, of the image. So you, can, uh, you have to identify what's the, what's the detail, how to make, to make those images look very nice. So as when you can identify those uh, details, you can apply those detail or expertise in your own image design. So that's my major, uh, 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 so I, I think the major strategy for combine, uh, so came out to be, came out a very nice image. And also this apply to your uh, experiment image as well. When you see those uh, high quality and high standard image, you know how to design your own figure. 
and make them extremely clean. And uh, so, so you can actually look into Jen's paper. I think that's a very good example. So I, I strongly recommend. And also Ximing's paper, I think that's a very nice on work. And uh, uh, so, so I think that's my, 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 my comments. And uh, probably Jen and Ximing can talk more about, about this aspect. I think you are, you are all experts in, in this area. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thanks, Chongko. Yeah, actually, I, I totally agree with you on like design is actually the most important thing. And also, YouTube and probably other, uh, probably other like video sharing channels are really like important learning sources. And um, I also got another question from Sophia. And uh, he said, uh, she said, like, hey, Chongko, very good talk. I have a small question on this current slide. Uh, I see you are using Pizzle Pillar. And uh, we know if you want to get a very high frequency, you have to make it very thin. So how challenging is the fabrication? Okay, okay, so that's my friend. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, so actually those materials, we do not fabricate ourselves. So it's a, it's a kind of a, a, a commercialized material and we can directly bought it from some uh, company and they can, they, they have already established a series of uh, uh, products that have various frequency ranging from like several kilohertz to several uh, to almost 100 megahertz. So have, they have a lot of range and a lot of uh, selection we can choose. Yeah, so we don't have to fabricate them ourselves. Okay, thank you, Chong. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you want to add something? Like, uh, sorry, I interrupt you. Oh no, no, no. I'm, Oh, okay, okay, cool. Uh, so, sorry, can I follow up another question? Sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah, Chung He Long Time No See. Uh, yeah. so, I, I don't come in from uh, this background, but um, I'm more curious is, so, so uh, this is one part that I don't really understand. Uh, the mm -hmm. part. You mentioned that uh, you, this is kind of, you try to use ultrasound wave to detect. And I know like from, for example, clinically the ultrasound, um, the how the way they detect, detect is like your mm -hmm. ultrasound waves encounters, for example, like vessel interface, and mm -hmm. then uh, some part were reflected and some, some part were transmitted. And basically mm -hmm. this echo when you're, uh, for the, this type of, like you kind of sensing the echoes between these two. Yeah. So do you think so like how, so I'm wondering how do you detect, like for example, first is do you use the same mechanism? And second is how do you detect like the echo and this part? Could you yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah, yeah. So, so I didn't add, add uh, too much explanation in this process because I think it's too much technical details. But uh, those are very, uh, very important in, in, in ultrasound physics. So, ultrasound basically is a mechanical wave that can propagate uh, uh, in, in, in a linear direction in, inside any media. Uh, so, actually, and the ultrasound has a different propagation speed in different different uh, uh, acoustic media, such as uh, solid or liquid. So it, it probably is more fa faster in solid and uh, and slower in, in liquid. So basically, the, the trend is the softer the material, the slower the propagation speed. And and this uh, so we have directly correlated this uh, softness and all rigidity to this uh, acoustic property. And when the ultrasound propagate between those between two different uh, media with two di different acoustic property, it will get a reflection at the interface. And uh, so this reflection will bounce back and received by the transducer. So, so the propagation time from the transducer and meet the first interface and then bounce back, this uh, total reflection time is called time of flight. And uh, this, this kind of time of flight is represented by the, the, by the peak in the, the time domain signal like this. So, so we can see a, a reflection peak like this. So by uh, by extracting the location of the of the peak, so we can know how long does this wave propagated from the transducer to the first interface, so that we can calculate this uh, this interface, the distance between the ultrasound transducer and the interface. So that's how we know the uh, the each location of of the of the interface. So basically, mm -hmm. ultrasound is a is a tool that can be used to detect the interface. So that's a uh, that's normally in, uh, used in B mode. Uh, that's called a uh, bright mode uh, ultrasound. So mm -hmm. it's also utilized in clinical uh, 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 
uh, of Sanfil. Mm -hmm. I see, I see, yeah, uh, makes sense. Uh, just add one more question, sorry. Uh, so uh, I don't also, because I, I don't have a background of um, the, the medical or the material, but I'm more interested for a student for the device. Uh, so because we know our strain is, so I know like for the strain of the skin, is you can you can regard it more like a like a bilayer, I guess. So it's kind of like a very linear strain. So I'm wondering how how is the strain property of your device and how good like the biocompatible it is. Oh yeah, good question. So mm -hmm. we encapsulate the device with a elastomer, it's basically a silicone called Ecoflex, and we use Ecoflex because it's a Young's modulus is similar to human skin. So that it will naturally conform to the skin and uh, deform the skin when we can uh, when it stretch or get get compressed. Uh, so keep the same volume, right? Like when yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. It's, they are the same mechanical property. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. So basically, like the the, the device and if especially use the elastomer, it could match the skin strain, like within yeah. either, like thirty percent yeah. or like sixty percent. Yeah, yeah, of course. And we can also tune the uh, uh, elastic property by, by doping different materials. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you, Chunghe. Very impressive. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah thank you, Sorry. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chunghe. And uh, we, got, we also got another question from Bi He, who is our uh, guest speaker from last episode. And uh, uh, can you give a brief intro on the current state of commercializing your technology or other similar to yours? Uh, what are the main obstacles? Yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, so uh, to the commercialization, there are certainly take, will take several years to realize uh, because we are still testing the post and circuit boards uh, compatible with uh, uh, compatible with the uh, with the uh, front end patch, and we are calibrating it to make it very uh, very stable and uh, uh, measurement measurement should be reproducible. And also, so so human body is actually moving around very very. Sometimes it will get a very severe movement. So uh, severe movement will introduce a lot of motion artifact. But uh, if we just move a little bit, it should be fine. So. We have to build some uh, algorithm that can tolerate this uh, severe movement of the, from the users because not everyone can hold their position while doing the measurement. So this is the second challenge. And third, we have to do a large number of clinical trials in both uh, healthy pa healthy people and patients. Uh, so it may, uh, we have to validate against like 80 pa 88 patients. Uh, so I, I think that may take some time as well. Uh, so that's basically, I think, the uh, basic thing we had uh, to make this come out to a product. Mm, uh, to, the, to the similar technology in industry, I think there are several watches that can measure in the blood pressure, but they, they are limited in the, in, in the measuring the pressure on the wrist. So some of them, they, they can build a miniaturized cuff on the, on the, on the watch. So it can be, inf they can inflate it and then uh, and do the measurement of the Blood pressure on your cuff. I saw some some people uh, wear it, but uh, this is not very widespread. And uh, some of the commercial companies like Omron, they public they they launch a product, but it is now still in the in early stage of uh, widely commercialization. They can measure the blood pressure as well using also using the arm cuff. So I think the most available technology similar to ours is that they always use arm cuff. So they, they cannot leave it with, uh, without this cuff. And uh, uh, so that's basically my observation in the field. And I don't, I don't see much of the blood pressure measurement in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the industry. So most of them, like Apple Watch and Fitbit, they measure in the ECG and the, the, at the waist and the, and the indicating our heartbeat. So that's the, that's, and then they say they can measure in the heartbeat, uh, heart rate variation, HRV and indicate like cardiac diseases. So that's what, what I can do related to car, uh, uh, cardiovascular monitoring. I think, I think well, what currently uh, our, the field is doing is very basic. So they cannot go very far. And uh, so our product also need time. So, so there might be some uh, competition. Mm -hmm. 
so I'm not sure. But uh, I'm totally not involved in the in the commercializing um, this product. Uh, yeah, but, but I'm certainly interested in, in, in doing more uh, entrepreneur maybe in the future after I graduate from PhD. Yeah, but uh, not related to the blood pressure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the, for the answers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so hi, Jen. Uh, hi. Can, can, I, can I ask one more question? <laughs> before, yeah, yeah, sure. Before, before the end of the, this topic. Yeah. So, Hi, hi, Chongke. Hi. Uh, can you can you share some of your perspective about using your technology for more practical use, like uh, sports monitoring? Because currently, this one of the hot hot research uh, hot application area, like mm. even John Rogers, Gao Wei. All of them, all of the wearable guys are doing this kind of uh, applications. Yeah, yeah. Can you share yeah, some think, of hmm. the? Of, the cost, yeah, yeah. Cost, you know, during our spots, daily spot, daily even even daily activity, there's a hmm. lot of interference, like sweat, like um, uh, furious motion, this kind of stuff. Can you share some your some of your perspective to to? Yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Very good question. Uh, so, so in my personal feeling, I, I definitely read a lot of work from uh, uh, Professor Gowes group and also John Hurdle's group. So, uh, uh, Wei's group is working on uh, 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 flexible patches and uh, to the chemical analysis of the sweat and decoding this, uh, 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 like. Uh, to do the uh, real time analysis of these chemicals. So that's very impressive. And I think this is very suitable for 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 spot monitoring. And uh, Professor Rogers has a lot of multifunctional patch can do the physiology, uh, electrophysiology sensing, and uh, so he also do a lot of uh, chemical sensor as well. Uh, so what we are doing in, in using ultrasound is uh, we monitoring these uh, interfaces together with, uh, uh, and specifically we are looking at the hemodynamics. And I believe this uh, hemodynamics will change drastically before and after exercises. And uh, either in the blood flow velocity or the blood pressure or the blood pressure waveform. And as you can tell in the blood pressure waveform, there are a lot of peaks and valleys and we represented a lot of uh, uh, heart activities. So we can, we can uh, either looking at the blood pressure value or like this uh, specific uh, peak and notches to, to see how well our uh, uh, ventricle or uh, atrial or uh, any valves are functioning. So, so I think that's a major difference between our work and the Professor Rogers or Professor Gao's work. And, uh, and I think this uh, exercise is certainly very, uh, uh, very large impact on, on the overall physiology. And I think those data can be used to indicate a lot of diseases. Which is uh, much important than uh, than your uh, uh, a piece status. Yeah, that's my my idea. Thank you, thank you for your question. Uh, thank you for your answer. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, thanks a lot. So we might have time for one last question if uh, anyone has questions, and if not, it's the time. And uh, yeah, so. If not, we will just conclude today's uh, today's talk, and uh, is and uh, thanks so much for for Chonghua to for today's presentation. It is really impressive, and it certainly inspired a lot of probably other other researchers as well. And uh, thanks so much for today's talk. Yeah, and uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Shin. And uh, very much thank you for everybody for your time. Yeah. So yeah, so now it's the, the end of today's talk. Yeah, and okay. see you in the next episodes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, see you guys. Yeah, see you. See you guys. See you. This is students from McGill University, and currently I'm doing my exchange study at the University of Toronto. 
and my research topic is around is about stretchable electronics and uh, soft robotics. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I think like uh, Shumi, I can make you a co-host. Like I never do this before. Like uh, like on Zoom, so you can probably manipulate a little bit. So am I a host or only you a host? How how can I make two hosts? <laughs> I'm already a host. I saw that on the screen. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but I, I'm no longer a host. So I don't know, like I can only allow one people to... Okay, then you should turn over, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but the thing is I cannot, I cannot be a host, like, because you are the host, you have to, like, transfer to... How I should do, how I should do. You can click on my name and there are some more, and just, like, make this one, make these people a host. I think I did it. Oh, yeah, I'm a host again. So I okay. guess because my Zoom is, like, not the highest, Okay. Package, so I can only do like uh, I host. I mean, probably I will upgrade later. Sumi, Sumi, Sumi. How is everything in LA? You mean the 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 pandemic? Pandemic. pandemic. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I every day I stay at home. Yeah. So. Really? <laughs> stay at home only? I don't know what's happening outside. No, nothing. <laughs> Probably you know more than me, actually. Yeah. Really? <laughs> I <laughs> I stay home as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and how how's 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 Boston, Chongte? Go ahead. Great. Yeah. Let's mute it. Okay. Yeah, everything is great, but the uh, United States everything is chaotic. <laughs> we are not okay. uh, allowed in the lab currently as well. Uh, I, I mean, I think everybody now can be can go back to that, but uh, I'm personally not. So okay. still work from home. Yeah, how about you? Yeah, in Toronto, the pandemic is. I mean, the situation is is getting better, but and and also lab is reopening, but we just carefully wearing mask when doing experiments. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Hope everything can be can be fine soon. Yeah, yeah. 